So we're looking in this series that's called uh, Looking for Love. And, uh, and so we've been playing with that song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places, recognizing that there's a truth in that. Uh, we, we often live that out, right? We're often looking for love in all the wrong places and all the wrong ways and with all the wrong expectations that we sometimes place on other people and how God wants to speak into our lives because we wrestle with this and he wants us to have great relationships. He's designed us for this. He wants us to look for love in right ways and in healthy ways and have healthy relationships. And so over the last two weeks, we've been opening this up, beginning with what I would call ground zero, right? The source of love, the source of God's love in our lives as we've looked at, at this relationship that he's invited us into. So we've looked at who God is and how he's moved to call us into this relationship with him. Last week, we focused more on ourselves and who we are and our identity in this relationship with him. And, and this relationship with God is where we have to begin if we are ever going to have healthy relationships with one another. This is what we have to begin with. In fact, Jesus shares this truth with us in what we call the two great commandments that he gives to us. One place we see that is in Matthew chapter 18. So this is what we read. They ask him the question, Jesus, what are the two greatest commandments? You know, what's the two things that, what's the thing that we have to do the most? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. We have to start, Jesus says, with this ultimate relationship. We have to get right with God and put this relationship first in our lives. And it's only when we do that, it's only when we have this right relationship with God and that that's the priority in our lives that we can now do this next part, beginning in verse 39. He says, the second command is like the first Love your neighbor as yourself, or love them, we could say, in the way that you long to be loved. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. It's only when we have this right relationship with God that we now have the capacity and the ability to really love others in this healthy way that God has designed us to live out, okay? Now, I think we've hit that pretty hard over the last couple of weeks. I'm not going to hit that again. You can catch it on YouTube if you missed it, okay? But today, I want to shift our attention to our relationships with other people, beginning with this area of friends and, and friendships that, that we really long to have. Now, as a culture, I think it's safe to say that we put a pretty high value on friendship, we want to experience different things with friends. And so we go to movies with them. We go to concerts. We go out to restaurants and go out to eat. We just hang out with our friends. because We want to experience life with our friends. With social media, you are now able to number your friends. The average person who engages in social media has an average of just over 330 friends, right? I have more, just to brag, just letting you know. <laughs> Katie and I used to have a competition, especially with Facebook, who would have more friends, because most of our friends are like the same, so the minute somebody would like me first, then her, you know, I was super cool just for like five minutes, right? With Facebook, we go even further. We have friend anniversaries. right? You celebrate when you became friends with someone, let alone all the different songs or shows or movies that are all about friendship. Friendship's a big deal. In fact, uh, let's just have some fun today. We're going to play... Name that show, Friend Edition. Now, the rules are this. It's, it's kind of like name that tune, okay? So we're going to play a tune, and the minute you know the show or the movie, just call out the answer. You ready for this? People have been asking, Kirk, what do you do with the teens whenever you teach them? Well, this is, this is kind of it. So now you know. Here we go. Friends, right? We're starting off easy. I'll be there for you. So we have Rachel, Monica, Phoebe, Joey, Chandler, and Ross. And for 10 years, people tuned in to just watch their lives unfold in this massively hit show in our culture, okay? I don't know if you watch it or not, but that's a picture of who they are. Friends, we're starting off easy. Here's another one that uh, we're going back a few years here, not too far. Try this one. High School Musical, okay, follows the life of the wild cats. So we've got Troy and Gabriella, Ryan and Sharpay, and they're dancing and singing with some of the usual high school drama that goes with that. So if you follow Disney Channel, you know, you've got this, okay? And they're actually revamping this. I think they're coming out with High School Musical 4. I think they should have stopped with maybe 1, 
personally, and they're launching a new show with this too from what, what the reviews are saying. Okay, now, here's one that I think hits us all maybe different times in our lives. Try this one out for size. Huh? Sesame Street, yes. Now, here's the dividing line, maybe for you. How many for Sesame Street was like pre-Elmo? Pre-Elmo, you watched it? Okay, how many are like post-Elmo? How many were like both because you grew up and then you had kids and grandkids, right? Okay. How many remember when Cookie Monster actually ate cookies? Maybe we could put it that way. <laughs> I watched one episode and he's eating broccoli. I'm like, what is what's this? This is not right. Go back to the cookie. Here's another one. More recent days. Try this one. You got friends. In the- Toy Story. Yep, yep. Buzz and Woody and the gang. How many cried when Andy went off to college? Yeah, I was in that too. I teared up a little. Going old school on this last one. Some of you are like, Kirk, I don't recognize it. They're too, they're too new. So here, try this one. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Right? You know this one. Cheers. Week after week, millions of people tuned in to watch this show. Right? We love shows like this. They were hanging out at a bar. We probably wouldn't do that. We're in church today. But we love shows like this because they speak about the value of friendship in our lives. We, we long for these kind of relationships, you know, the Buzz and Woody kind of relationship. If you go back to Toy Story, there is this massive longing for belonging in our lives where everybody knows your name, or at least somebody does. And, and when I say that, I mean know you beneath just the, the surface, the facade that we often wear, that mask that everybody kind of sees, but knows you deeply. I mean, they know who you really are. And you just have this sense that, man, you belong with them and they belong with you. And there's this connection there. And this isn't some weakness in us. This desire for deep friendships, it's not a weakness. This is part of God's design and plan for your life and mine. Okay? Now, you would think that over the thousands of years that we've been on the planet, that, uh, that we would have figured out how to do this friendship thing well. As much as it's important to us, as much as we celebrate it, you'd think that we would know how to look for and, and find friends. But the truth is that because of sin in us and, and sin in this world, you know the next part, right? It's, it's distorted, God's design for you and for me, and it's blocked God's purpose from our lives, especially in this area, so that now we wrestle with having real meaningful relationships and friendships. We fail to do this thing well. We look for friendships and meaningful relationships in all the wrong places, in all the wrong ways, and many times in all the wrong people, okay? And we come up empty time and time again, more alone than ever before. In fact, a recent survey Uh, shows that loneliness in America is really on the rise. It's bizarre to think that that's possible in in our day and age, isn't it? We are more connected than ever before because of technology. You you got your cell phone. People can catch you anywhere you are. You just ring and, and your pocket starts vibrating. You pull it out and there's somebody on the other end. Social media lets us connect with with friends all over the globe. So you've got neighbors down the street, you've got coworkers, we've got people that we grew up with that we haven't talked to in ages, and then people that we met yesterday, all connected on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Never in history has communicating with other people been easier than it is for us today. And yet never in American history have people felt more isolated and alone than they do today. I said there's a new survey. It was released just over a year ago telling that our population just feels alone. In fact, over half of our population lists it that way. Generation X, my generation, used to be the top of the chart there. Now, you would think that it might be people that are maybe in their senior years uh, in a nursing home or something like that where many of their friends, they're no longer able to be around them. That's actually not the case. Generation X was at the top. But in recent years, the millennial generation and then the one behind them, like my kids, Generation Z, have blown past Generation X in saying that they just feel lonely and isolated and all alone in the world. 
even in a crowd of people. We're talking ages 18 to 37. Off the chart, loneliness. And much of the depression that we see around us, so much of the destructive relational abuse and then also chemical abuse and addiction, so much of the rampant rise in suicide stems directly from the struggle, the struggle to find and engage in healthy friendships. We're more connected than ever. We feel more alone than ever. We're longing and we're looking for friends, but we're just doing it in the wrong way, in the wrong places, in unhealthy ways, and we just keep coming up empty. And because we struggle here so much, I really believe God wants to speak into our lives. The one who created us, the one who designed us for relationships has something to say about how to do this in a healthy and right way. You agree with that? You believe that today? And we need him to speak to us about this. So here's the deal. When, when we're dealing with God and asking him to help us in the different relationships that we have, uh, God rarely, if ever, starts with the other person. God, I, I just want you to, to fix my marriage. Well, you know what? God's going to transform your marriage by beginning by transforming you. That's where he starts. He starts with you. God, I, I want this friendship to be healthy. Well, guess where God's going to start? He's going to start with you, and he's going to grow you and then grow your relationship through that. You, you bring your relationship with your parents to God, I guarantee God's going to start with you because this is just how God moves, right? You get the picture? In our relationships with other people, God begins with us. That's how he begins to help us because he knows that we long for great friendships, but he also knows this truth, that to really have great friendships means learning how to be a great friend. And so he's going to begin with you and me because this is where it begins. And that really brings up the question, right? What, are, what then are the marks of a great friend? And the Bible's filled with all sorts of different examples on this. We're not going to cover everything today. We just don't have that kind of time. But I think we can touch on some areas that we can all grow in. And so can we all agree to do that, grow in this area of friendship? In fact, just turn to your neighbor and tell them, I want to grow to be a better friend. Just tell them that today, okay? I want to grow to be a better friend. We can do this. We can do this. So one of the places that uh, the Bible showcases a great friendship um, is really between two guys in the Old Testament named Jonathan and David. Jonathan and David. And while we don't see their entire friendship, we don't see every moment by moment chronicled for us, we do see some, I, I would call, significant moments that give us a good picture of what great friends and a great friendship look like. And so let's just kind of open up and jump into this. But before we do, uh, let me give you a little bit of the backstory to, to catch you up on where we're, where we're getting into this. Now, most of us, I think, are familiar with the story of David and Goliath. Right, so we've got this kind of young teenage guy who's squaring, he's a shepherd boy, right? He's squaring off against this, this nine foot towering hulk of a guy named Goliath. I mean, he's a trained warrior. And, uh, and so David, though, he's clinging to God and a sling and he takes out Goliath. God gives him this massive victory with this slingshot well, for, for David, but also for, really for the nation of Israel. Jonathan happens to be the crown prince of Israel at the time, sees this and instantly, man, he is just drawn to David. He sees this, this courage in him. He sees this fierce devotion to God. These and other qualities are what these two men kind of had in common. If you were to back up, you could see this actually in Jonathan's life just a few chapters earlier. And it wasn't long before these two guys were, I mean, they're inseparable. I mean, they're stuck together like peanut butter and jelly, right? They are the best of friends. And it's really the beginning of this friendship where we see, I think, the first mark of a great friend given to us. So that kind of sets the scene. It's right after this massive showdown between David and Goliath, a little bit after that. We're jumping into 1 Samuel chapter 18, picking up in verse 3. Now, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. 
And so Jonathan took off the robe that he was wearing and he gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and even his belt. Okay? Now, initially, you, you might read this and think, eh, it seems just a little bit odd. I mean, what's the deal with Jonathan kind of stripping off his clothes and then giving them to David and saying, hey, put these on, man. Right? That just seems a little odd. But actually, in that culture, this is a really big deal because what Jonathan was doing is is that he's trying to make this covenant commitment with David. That's what he's doing here. And really, that's the first mark of a great friend. A great friend is committed. A great friend is committed. That's, That's what we're looking at here. Jonathan's making this commitment Now, let me just briefly teach on this. I know we've opened this up before, but let me just kind of show you again what's going on here because we're separated by a few thousand years of history and a little bit of culture. There's a little gap here. So, when Jonathan gives David his royal robe and his tunic, it's really symbolizing the blending of their lives together. Now, back in that day, People were recognized by the clothing that they wore, especially like an outer clothing, this, this robe especially, okay? Because you would see people off in the distance and you would recognize them. We were coming in uh, from McDonald's today and I said, oh, I think that's so-and-so from our church. And they said, well, how do you know that? I said, well, because of the truck there. It, I think it's the same color as this other person. They're on their way to church. I was wrong, right? But that's how we kind of recognize people off in the distance, right? And uh, no, it's not an exact science, right? But we kind of see this. So we see someone wearing a coat or we see someone wearing a jacket, maybe across the store. And before you ever see their face, you know who they are by the clothes that they are wearing. We still do this today. So for someone to give you their robe and their tunic means that now David, when he's off in the distance, people are going to look and say, oh, that's Prince Jonathan coming our way. It was their way of blending their lives together and saying, what's mine is yours and what's yours is is now mine it was all about establishing this massive commitment okay now the sword and the belt and the bow just kind of reinforce this in a couple of different ways okay so when jonathan gives the sword and the bow he gives these weapons to david it's his way of committing his his strength to him right i'm committing my strength and he's saying no matter what comes against us I've got your back, man. I will protect you. And this is my way of showing you. I'm giving you my strength right now. I'm going to protect you. It's my promise. The belt sends yet another message. Now, belts back then did a whole lot more than, you know, hold your pants up. That's where they held your possessions, especially your money. So when he takes off his belt and he hands this to David, it would be like you taking out your wallet and giving it to someone else. Okay, picture that. And as he hands his wallet to him, what he's saying is, no matter what we go through, and no matter what you face, David, I'm going to be right there, and I'm going to provide everything that I can for you. Whatever you need, I'm I'm going to try my best to give it to you. I'm in this with you. You see how that's taking shape here now? This moment that looks strange to us is really all about this absolute commitment that Jonathan is making to his friend David. It's this awesome commitment because great friends are committed. They're committed. Now, here's the deal. Not all commitments have to have these huge grand gestures or huge acts, right? We often look for the big grand gestures in in moments to kind of prove things to us. But the truth is that what often means more are little commitments lived out over and over and over and over and over again. Let me give you an example. I've shared before that I got a friend named Dan. He used to live here in Wabash. We connected shortly after I moved to town because he was serving as a pastor in one of the churches here. And from time to time, we would get together and we'd hang out. We kind of developed a friendship. But then Dan moved away. Now, when he moved away, we made a commitment to each other that every Monday we would connect on the phone for one hour, maybe a little longer, but we would always try to cram in that hour. And over the line, over the course of time, I should say, we have kept this commitment. Now, it's not anything huge, right? I, I didn't, like, take off my jacket. and give, I didn't give him a sweatshirt, say, we're committed to each other, buddy, right? Biblical style. I didn't do that. It's just this small commitment where we connect with each other week after week after week just for that hour. That small commitment has been played out 
hundreds of times over the last four to five years. And so I absolutely know Dan has my back. He prays for me constantly. He is there to help me. He knows that I am there to help him. No matter what we go through, we know the other person has our back. Not because of a huge grand gesture, but because of our commitment lived out to each other week after week after week. We're consistent in showing up. A great friend is committed. You with me? All right. Now, shortly after Jonathan and David established this, this commitment, this great friendship, this covenant with each other, Jonathan's dad, King Saul, began to grow intensely jealous of David. God, God gave victory to David over Goliath. We looked at that, right? And he did that while Saul was out hiding in fear. God gave David victory over the enemies of Israel, especially the Philistines, Enemies that Saul refused to ever face. David's fame grew. And as David's fame grew, Saul's jealousy of David, his hatred for him also grew. Finally, Saul hatched a plan. The only way to deal with David was to kill him. But he didn't tell Jonathan about it. Because he knew that the two of them, they were inseparable. They were committed to each other. They were tight. And so Jonathan, he was clueless about what his father was doing and and the people that he'd lined up to to knock David off. Now that kind of brings us to chapter 20. It gives the backdrop for this moment. This is what we read there. Then David fled from Naoth to Ramah, and he went to Jonathan, and he asked, What have I done, man? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? And again, Jonathan's clueless on this. Never, Jonathan replied. You're not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? This isn't so. But David took an oath. And he said, your father knows very well that I found favor in your eyes. And he said to himself, Jonathan must not know about this or he will be grieved. As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, There is only one step between me and death. Now, there's a whole lot that we can actually unpack throughout chapter 20. But it really begins, I think, in this moment as David just pours out his heart to Jonathan about what he's facing and what he's going through. And here's the truth that I want us to see in this moment, that a great friend is real. A great friend is real. They are authentic They're open, they're vulnerable. Great friend is real. You can't have deep relationships unless you're willing to share about the real issues in your life and let people see the real you beneath the mask. Okay? Now, here's where technology has actually made it a little bit harder for us. Because it's really easy to hide behind your phone or hide behind a computer screen. And there's this enormous pressure, especially with social media, to compete with all the great things that other people post about themselves. Because most people on social media are only going to post the highlights of their life. Point in case, I know I blew a lot of people away when I posted four times in one week. Most of you who know me, if if you're on Facebook at all, you know that I get on there maybe once a week, right? Because I just, I don't take time for this. It's just not my thing, but it's important to engage in it from time to time. So I, I posted this week, Katie and I took the girls to Indianapolis to the Hits Deep live tour, awesome concert, a lot of people. So I'm posting pictures of the different artists as they're coming out on the stage, and and I'm all pumped up about this, posting pictures of the family. It's just a fun time. Later in the week, we were like bipolar. We shift over from that rap concert to the sound of music, (laughs) right? It is an immense swing if you've never been in those types of environments before. But it was awesome, and we're at the Honeywell, and it was a great show. And again, I'm taking a picture, posting of the family. 
and we're just having a fun time, and, and it's great to share those highlights on Facebook. You know what I didn't post? The non-highlights of my week. I did not snap a picture of me working this week. It's really, really not all that cool or interesting. I didn't tell you about the leftovers that I ate just about every day. I didn't talk about the meetings that I had to sit through and attend. I didn't, I didn't share all the time I spent folding laundry. None of us really post that stuff. Okay, and the people in your life who do post about their meals and their hour-by-hour -hour activities are the ones that you typically block from your news feed. Emily? Call me <laughs> I'm so teasy. We were laughing about this this morning because... Because uh, Sadie has uh, something wrong with her settings and all of Emily's posts just keep filling up Sadie's news feed. And so I'm totally teasing you. She doesn't do that. All of us who engage in social media typically only post the highlights, right? And it's fun to post and share highlights with people. But here's the danger with social media, if I can bring this back. It's made being real a whole lot harder. And this is why. Because we feel that we have to compete with other people. Our insecurity drives us to that. There's this pressure of, of what to say and how to say it because people might comment or sometimes you want people to comment or sometimes you're afraid of what they might comment. And so we try to project this, this image of, of who we want to be, this, this perfect life, the perfect pictures that we edit, the perfect posts, the perfect meals, the perfect activities of what we believe life should be like. Okay? Okay. And then we try really hard in the real world to live up to that. And it's almost impossible. And when we do that, when we try to live up to this social media mask that we create, we grow isolated. And you know what? It's, it's really impossible for someone to get close to you if you're just all about this facade. It's really hard. Now, at the same time, let's look at the other side for a moment. It's really hard for people to maintain a close relationship with someone who shares in a way that dominates the conversation. They're sharing almost too much without ever taking into consideration what this other person's going through. Okay? So you really need to find a balance here because being real means real sharing, but being real also means really caring about this other person and listening to them. So you have to be willing to listen. Find the balance in this, in your relationships when it comes to being real. But this is one of the marks. A real friend is real. Okay? Here's another mark of a great friendship. Great friends are encouraging. Great friends are encouraging. We all need that one, don't we? David definitely needed this. Now let's jump ahead to 1 Samuel 23, and, and as we do, let me just kind of give you again what's going on in David's life. He is, he is on the run from Saul. This is really kind of the beginning stages. It's been a few days, weeks, months, we're not really sure, but it's kind of the beginning of, of several years that he lives on the lamb. He's hiding in caves. He's, he's living out in, in the woods like a bandit because Saul has his entire army out hunting David down. Knowing his friend is struggling, Jonathan sneaks off from his father, from the army, to find David. This is what we read, 1 Samuel 23, beginning in verse 16. Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. I have to say that, that I find this moment incredible. You have to kind of put yourself in Jonathan's position to see it, right? He crosses his father. He crosses the king that's already tried to kill him once, his own father. As he does that, he also crosses enemy lines. The people who are trying to protect David from Saul and presumably from anyone in Saul's army and Jonathan's part of that. He takes his entire life in his hands. He puts it all on the line. Enemies all around him. And his only goal is to reach David so that he can just encourage his friend. 
And he gets to David and he speaks this reminder to him. He says, you know what? You got to remember God's protection over your life, man. Amen. My father Saul, he, he's not going to find you. God won't let it happen. He's watching over you. God's watching over you. And at the same time, it's not just protection, but he also speaks this reminder of God's promise over David's life. He says, remember, remember what God has spoken over you. You have this destiny ahead of you, David. God has declared, God has declared that you will be king. Just hang in there a little bit longer because God's going to lead you through this. You see that? Cross his enemy lines just to come in and strengthen his friend, encourage him. Great friends are encouraging. We all need that, don't we? Man, we need that. There is so much junk in this world that tears at us. There are so many negative voices that plague us all the way through our lives, speaking to us about our worth in not so positive ways. They seek to tear us down and destroy us. And it's awesome when we can find a great friend who is there to really build us up. Now, now, when I say that, I'm not talking about, you know, just pumping up somebody's ego. Oh, you're so awesome. I love you. You're the best person ever. Right? When I'm talking about that, not talking about that. Real encouragement is all about reminding someone who they are in Jesus. Amen. That's what we looked at last week, right? And so it's all about reminding people, you know what? You are a child of God. This is who you are. Remember whose you are. You are a child of God. You belong to this ultimate loving Father. He is moving to help you in this moment. And I don't get everything that you're going through, but I know you're a child of God. I know that you are an heir of God. And what that means is that God's not holding back on you, but the best that He has, man, He is trying to give it to you in this moment because you're an heir. You have to remember God's spoken this promise over your life. He didn't promise that every day would be rosy, but He did promise that He would hold on to you. He did promise that He has a greater destiny ahead of you. He did promise that there is this heaven to be gained if you just keep living life with Him. Okay? Man, a great friend is encouraging. There's one more moment I want us to see, and I know we're just kind of blitzing through this. You could just spend days opening up each one of these passages and exploring this but let's skip forward in time several years into the future from where we just were Saul and Jonathan uh, uh, they're tragically killed in this battle against the Philistines after that David becomes king eventually he becomes king over the entire nation of Israel now typically a new king when they're established one of the first things that they'll do is that they'll wipe out the family of the former king that way there's no competition right It's like if the Republicans gained everything and they just took out every Democrat in sight. There's no competition anymore, right? That's just kind of a symbolic deal of what's going on typically in the kingdoms in the ancient times. They would do this. It's just a way of preventing rebellion, securing power. I think you get that. David, David moves in a completely opposite direction. Here's what we read in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Let me just give you verse 3. So David's the king, and he asks, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba, who's a servant, answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. Uh, He's lame in, in both feet. And so David, he gets this information, finds out where Jonathan's son is, immediately dispatches soldiers to go and get this guy. They drag him before the king. Jonathan's son thinks that his life is over because of what history has taught him. But then David does the unexpected and he moves in grace. He lifts Jonathan up off the floor, Jonathan's son I should say, up off the floor. And he says, I'm going to give you all of the lands that your father Saul used to have. I'm restoring all of that to you. I'm giving you all of these servants that used to work for your grandfather and for your father. I'm giving them back to you to do all the work for you because I know you can't do this. And more than that, I'm giving you a seat at my own table. I I want you to sit here like one of my own sons. Every time we get the family together and we have a meal, you have a place with us. It's this 
absolute incredible mark of great friendship and, and a great friend. A great friend is full of grace. It's full of grace. David completely overlooks the hostility shown to him by Saul, Jonathan's dad, and really all of Saul's family, with the exception of Jonathan. Just about everybody else in the family hated David. David overlooked the natural tendency to hold on to resentment and bitterness and to give in to revenge, and instead he shows grace. Now, I get that most of us, probably all of us, will never face anything quite like what David lived down. But we are all going to face moments where we need to extend grace to our friends because they're going to disappoint you, they're going to frustrate you, they're going to let you down. Sometimes they're even going to hurt you because they're not perfect. Here's the truth we also need to hear. Neither are we. For great friendships to last, they need to be saturated and covered and full of grace. We need to live ready to forgive. Believe the best about our friend and cover this relationship with grace. I mean, the same grace that God extends to you and to me every day. Every day. Right? Because we're all looking. We're all longing for great friends. It's just, it's just part of how God has wired us up. Right? But the truth is that we wrestle here. So often we chase after this, these friendships in unhealthy, toxic, selfish, self-centered kinds of ways. We have this tendency to, to use people, sometimes even use and exploit our friends to make us feel good, to serve us and our interests. We wrestle with with creating deep and lasting relationships that just go the distance in life. Okay, But the greater truth than that is that God's calling us up in this. He's calling us to grow in this area of being a great friend. Someone who is committed through the good times and the bad. You hang in there. Someone who's real with others, sharing what's really going on in your life, but also caring enough to listen. Someone who seeks to to encourage and and really build others up. Someone who moves in grace. I mean, you're going to believe the best and you're going to live ready to forgive. And because of Jesus at work in your life and mine, we now have the capacity and the ability and the opportunity to live like this and really speak this life into the people around us. Right? Can you imagine just for a moment the impact for Jesus you can have on your friends if you just follow really his example, how he lives towards us, what it means to be a great friend. Can you see how as you live this out that you would just be massively connecting people to him? Right? And so when others ask you, man, why are you so committed? Other people, man, they bailed on me. Why are you still hanging in here? Why do you care so much about what's going on in my life? You just point to Jesus. You know what? It's because of Jesus and the commitment he lives towards me. Man, I'm just living it towards you. And as you listen, as they pour out their heart and they say, man, this is what I'm going through. And you say, yeah, I've been there. And they say, well, what would you do? And and you start sharing about what you went through, right? As you get real beneath the mask, beneath the surface, and you start to show them how you made it through these different things, you're just pointing to Jesus. And you tell them, you know, I I don't know what I would have done in that situation if it hadn't been for Jesus, and, and He just pulled me through. He's the only way I could have made it. As you move to encourage them, you're building them up. You're speaking His life, Jesus' life, into their life. You're blessing them. You're telling them about this great destiny that God has ahead of them. You're just trying to connect them to Jesus every time you do that, right? And as you keep pouring grace again and again, you're just showing the grace of God, His very life being poured into yours as you pour it out over them. 
Do you see? Do you see how you're helping to connect your friends to Jesus if you just live this out? Amen. He's calling us to grow in this area. People are looking for a relationship. You know, it's the number one reason why people come to church. A lot of times, they don't even know to look for God yet. But they have a relationship that they have with you. They start to see glimpses of what love really looks like because of you. And you have this massive capacity to impact the lives of people all around you by just being a great friend. And you're connecting them to Jesus every step of the way. So here's the question as we kind of wrap it up today. How can you grow in being a great friend?